Welcome to the Clarksville Now candidate forums for the House District 68 Republican primary. Uh, I think I got all those words right. Um, we have with us the four candidates uh, for this position to replace uh, Curtis Johnson, who's retiring this year. Um, the candidates are um, Carol Duffin, Joe Smith, Aaron Mayberry, and Greg Gilman. And um, we're going to start with them talking about their qualifications, and then we'll get into some of the issues in the race. So, uh, Ms. Duffin, uh, talk to us about your qualifications to run for this office. Thank you, Chris, and thank you to Clarksville Now. I believe the most important qualification anyone seeking public office should have is integrity. And probably the most concise definition of integrity is what a person does when no one is looking. I have, and I always will, do what is right as I serve this community. I want to maintain my integrity throughout my personal life as well as my professional life. And I strive to be consistent in my convictions and my actions, whether the camera is on or off. Secondly, being involved in your community and knowing the issues and concerns are essential. I have extensive experience running a grassroots, grassroots advocacy group, researching the issues, and always maintaining input from the community. I have successfully lobbied the Tennessee legislature as a regular taxpaying citizen. And during my tenure, I have written legislation, filed bills, worked with leadership and all the members of the legislature and testified before many committees. I understand the process and I know what it takes to create a coalition of support and will continue to do so when I'm elected. All right. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Smith on qualifications. Thanks, Chris. Appreciate y'all having me here. My name is Joe Smith. I'm born and raised native of Clarksville, Tennessee. What makes me most qualified to hold this seat is that I'm currently a county commissioner in my sixth year on a county commission, and I'm a regional planning commissioner and your current mayor pro tem of Montgomery County. I've been involved in budget meetings. I've been involved on working on committees, which means working with other people to get things done. To get stuff done at the state level, you have to work with 98 other legislators to get the job done. And I believe that I'm the only qualified candidate with that type of experience at the government level. Thank you. All right. Mr. Mayberry, on qualifications. Thank you. Hello, my name is Aaron Mayberry. I'm the husband of an amazing wife, my high school sweetheart of eight, over 18 years. I have three kids uh, who are all still in school. I am a Clarksville native. I actually attended East Montgomery, Richview, Clarksville High, and I graduated the second class at Ross U High School. I'm currently the only elected Republican on the school board, and I'm one of those elected officials that will respond to your emails, texts, and phone numbers. And when I'm elected to the state representative, I will respond to yours as well. I love the faith community here in Montgomery County, and I'm the family pastor of Mosaic Church. I have served to build up people and build leaders for nearly 20 years. And I've discovered that the same passion that I have in ministry, I have in, in representing and serving you as an elected official. I know how to build relationships and I know how to build community. This is important when you need to work, to work together with other people to get things done for you. I'm a lifelong conservative and I believe I could be the conservative voice for a new generation of Republicans right here as your nominee to as state representative for District 68. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Gilman, I'm Well, first of all, Chris, thanks for inviting me. Mm -hmm. um, I've lived in Clarksville for 37 years now, so I've decided to make this my home. It's in my heart. Retired military. While I was in the military, I had several high-level positions. Some of them were a safety officer, some of them for acquisition, some for contracts, um, equipment, probably a billion and a half dollars worth of equipment, 3,500 or more personnel. So in that, there's different, I'd say, federal regulations, state regulations, and local regulations you have to go through. So I know how to negotiate those. Also, I've been a reserve deputy here in Montgomery County for going on 11 years. And I love this area. It's in my heart. At this age, people would ask, why are you doing this? It's because something has to be done, and it needs to be a citizen legislator that hasn't had a position in government prior to this. Thank you. All right, let's um, talk about some of the issues uh, in the race. Probably uh, Clarksville's biggest growing pain has been the lack of road infrastructure, and most of the problems are on state highways. Uh, what would you do to ensure that we get adequate state highway funding? And we'll start this time uh, with you, Joe. 
So when I am elected into this office, I would really like to get on the transportation committee or the subcommittee at least and work towards getting Clarksville's fair share. Middle Tennessee has one of the highest populations in the state as far as per capita of Middle East or, or West, and we feel like we're not getting our fair share from the state when it comes to our capital projects on road, road projects. We have every major route in Clarksville coming in or out of it is a state route. Even some of these two-lane side roads that people think are just a county road or a city road are actually state routes. We need to come up with a comprehensive plan, a 10, a 15, and a 20 year plan that adapt with time. And we need to figure out a way to fund those using the excess. The state has been very fiscally responsible. Last year, I do know the state funded each county about $500,000 to their highway department. I'd like to see that increased. And our highway department can move some projects along a little bit faster and help the state get some of these side roads and connector roads that feed the main arteries uh, better adequate for our, our, car, our cars, our bikes, our walk pedestrian traffic. There's ways we can do it, but it all starts with creating a 15 and a 20 and a 10 year plan that's very comprehensive and involves all parties. All right, um, Aaron, on um, um, what we would do to ensure adequate highway funding. Absolutely. Clarksville's growing whether we like it or not. We've grown over 32% in the last 14 years. And I truly love our community and believe Clarksville is the best place to live on earth, not just because Money Magazine told us so. With this information, we need to sure up our infrastructure to make sure, because one thing is for sure, we're gonna go, going to continue to grow and we're gonna to continue to have bogged down infrastructure if we don't do something. So with uh, TDOT recently announced a 10 year plan that is allocated millions of dollars to expand Trenton and I-24 in a section there that will begin in 2029. This is a start, but we must do more and we must do it faster. I am excited that in 2023, our state legislator approved the Tennessee Modernization Act. This has given $3 billion to Tennessee for infrastructure projects and is divided up into different sums, different regions. And we in this region have $750 million to get infrastructure done here in this area. There's also a sum of $300 million that's allocated as grants to local governments. And I would work with our city and local governments to make sure we get the biggest part of that pie as possible. It also allows private uh, public partnerships calling choice lanes for uh, helping with congestion. And I don't know about you, but I would love from exit one, going past exit 11, all the way to Nashville for us to have a lane going all the way down. But I would also love to see one of these choice lanes coming all the way to Nashville that if you'd like to, you can pay to get on and just bypass all the traffic. We must work with our colleagues in the region to help champion this cause. As the State General Assembly has appropriated, it says even more funds for specific projects and we can get something accomplished together. I know how to bring people together to get things done for a specific cause. And I believe I would be the best choice for state representative representing you as we get laid down the groundwork as your state representative. Thank you. And um, Greg, on uh, adequate state funding for highways? Sure. We've, we've got a large amount of money to work on the roads here in Clarksville. The problem is, is the bureaucracy slows that down. So let's take, for example, any project we do, we have to have a need statement. Then we have to go through the NEPA, which is National um, Environmental Protection Agency, to see if it's okay. Then an engineering study then buy property rights, then we got to put it into contracting. So if you have to go through all these processes and you got a 10, 15, 20 year plan, where do they fit into that plan? If we're not already thinking about that now. But the, the fact is there's waivers for, for most of these processes. TDOT has had a lack of oversight because if we look back in these forums that we do and go back, 10, 15 years, every time we talk, we talk about infrastructure, but nothing is getting done. So for example, let's make it simple. So we say that the National um, Environmental Protection Act has to look to see if a project we're gonna do fits into that. Well, I would submit that I-24 already has that done. There's an interstate there. So let's just take in our district, cause that's what we're running for. So we're all familiar with exit 11. So if you take from the bridge, there's a truck lane, the truck lane ends, then you go to exit 11 to get off to the exit. The truck lane should go all the way up. How hard really is it 
to put a shoulder out there at one more lane. TDOT has the equipment to do this themselves. We don't even have to get a contract for that. But it has to be on somebody's radar. If there needs to be a need statement to get something done on all these little things, and we can't just look at the big things. We have to look at what little things do. Just like the other day when they took off the dead stop at the red light, you can't turn until you, till the light, light turns green. They took that down, now you can turn. It's little things, it's lanes extra things that we can do, but sometimes it's the small things and not the long range things that are going to alleviate congestion around here till we get to those things. Thank you. And I'm Carol on uh, adequate funding for state highways. Yeah, this is such a great question. Road infrastructure is one of the primary concerns of the people that I've talked to in the community. In fact, just today, I was stuck in traffic on Warfield Boulevard for 40 minutes. And Chris, as you know, we have nine state highways in Clarksville. In 2017, Tennessee passed the IMPROVE Act, which increased the gas tax to help uh, fund improvements for our roads. Unfortunately, our growth has far exceeded the original plan. In order to get adequate funding for these highways, there are four steps that I would initially take. One is to evaluate and research the current needs for improvements to the roads and assess the travel uh, traffic bottlenecks throughout our city and our state. Certainly one of the major concerns that affect our constituency is I-24 to and from Nashville. The research I put into these improvements comes from my desire to be part of the solution because obviously I live here too, but I do travel to Nashville frequently for work. Secondly, once these evaluations are complete and feasible solutions are obtained, I would build a coalition, a coalition of legislators who are representing cities south, east, and west of Clarksville, who may have state highways also running through their towns, and explain my case and the vast benefits of us working together. Third, I would educate every single member of the Transportation Committee on why it is imperative to fund these roads. And finally, I would take this data to the chair and the co-chair of the Transportation Committee to begin to hold TDOT accountable in implementing these necessary road projects. Thank you. Um, next issue uh, to discuss here, and this time we'll start with uh, Mr. Mayberry. Um, hospitals across Tennessee have been in crisis with many rural uh, hospitals closing. Do you support Medicaid expansion? And if not, how do you propose that we address the need for more access to health care in Tennessee? I do not support Medicaid expansion. Government takeovers of health care only makes things worse. Before Obamacare, my family only paid 270 bucks a month for our health insurance. Afterwards, with the same insurance from Farm Bureau, we pay nearly $800 a month. And I know many families, they pay way more. This has put a burden on my family and so many other families out there. I believe we need to fund patients, not insurance companies. And by using a universal personal health care credit, using the personal option, using health savings accounts. However, SHAs are only available to about 10% of Americans. Congress should change the law that every American can have an access to an H HSA. To accomplish this, we need to work with our state health uh, commissioner and federal leaders on the national platform to better address this on a state level. The personal option would mean more choice for you and control for you. The competition would bring uh, costs down. It would empower patients, doctors, and nurses, and innovate with health, health uh, care in the healthcare industry. And not it would not help indus, uh, insurance companies or government bureaucrats. It would remove barriers for you that impede your care to, uh, to access care. It would also uh, offer Americans more choice and flexibility to, in their own health care decisions. And it doesn't require a single penny in new taxes, which is the best, best part of this. On another note, the state legislator just passed a certificate of need reform. I'm really excited about this because our certificate of need reform uh, in, the, in, in the last 20 years has been very harmful to our, towards our healthcare here in Tennessee. One to five healthcare innovations were rejected in Tennessee in the past 20 years. Sadly, more than 5.5 million Tennesseans were denied increased access to health care. Government shouldn't arbitrarily limit access to patients by protecting current providers competition. 
I believe we should reform with more competition, and I believe this has also potentially opened a door for another hospital right here in Montgomery County. As your state representative in District 68, I would work to make this legislation work for us and for you. All right. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Gilman, on um, the uh, how we address the needs for more access to health care in Tennessee. Sure. Um, as far as Medicaid expansion goes, the problem with that, anytime we take money from the federal government, then we also have to take and deal with those rules and the management of that. And this is a complicated question. First of all, I'm against it as its current form, and I don't know why we just can't get Medicaid money without that, but under the Obamacare and the Affordable Care Act, that's that came with it. I certainly support expanding Tennessee's uninsured through 10 care. And somehow, legislatively, we will find the money to do that. Unfortunately, we can't cover everybody right away because we don't have that kind of funding. The problem with hospitals closing is when Medicare and Medicaid reimbursement levels pay more to these health care providers, if they work in a big city, they do in a rural hospital, then they're going to leave those rural hospitals. When we have large medical corporations buying out the hospitals, we need, as a legislator and as a legislative body, try to work out some kind of agreement to help get money and hospitals to stay open so we can provide this in these rural communities. It's typically an older uh, generation of folks which, and, and as they need more health care as they get older, and then the, the health care providers are leaving. That we took a big hit during COVID, absolutely. And a lot, of, a lot of hospitals closed. But somehow, Tennessee has to figure out how to incentivize through these big corporations that are taking over in these hospitals to keep them there and provide health care for these un, undeserved, um, underserved patients in these rural areas. So I would, I would definitely work hard for that. And we also um, need to, there's, there's children with disabilities that need to be covered. They are somewhat on 10 care, but we need to expand that even further. Thank you. Um, Stefan, on uh, Medicaid expansion and improving access to health care. I believe everyone should have access to health care, and my heart goes out to those who are struggling to obtain it. Sadly, rural hospitals have been closing for decades, and it's mainly due to physician and nursing shortages, as well as hospital reimbursements. President Obama did pass the Affordable Care Act, which does uh, provide subsidies for people to obtain health insurance. And rather than investing more money from the federal government, and basically the taxpayers of Tennessee and across the country, and expanding Medicaid, I believe we would be better served assisting and educating. The ACA, as we understand, is, is difficult in its enrollment process and um, hard to understand. We should spend time, not taxpayers' money, educating Tennesseans on the programs that are currently available and provide assistance for those who need these programs. We should also do more to assist people with assessing resources to improve their overall health and their quality of life. I want to help people understand what is already available as far as government resources for legal U.S. citizens, as well as caring enough for the individual to provide assistance and education for these resources without spending additional tax dollars. Thank you. And um, Mr. Smith on uh, Medicaid expansion and providing better health care. Well, I for one am not for Medicaid expansion. Uh, I am for more of a limited government type platform. I don't believe when the government gets involved, it helps the situation. Uh, what you end up having is a lot of government oversight and that limits things when it comes to providing services and it does not help the end patient, which is the end user. So what we need to do is, like previous speaker said, access to information, access to plans, and we need to have friendly competition when it comes to insurance. Healthcare is one of the only things that the government tries to limit when it comes to insurance. They don't limit you on your home insurance or on your car insurance or anything of that nature, but they'd like to dip their hand in healthcare. And that has not allowed for a friendly competition 
type atmosphere where they had to be competitive with their rates and that that's what's caused the, the major increases over the last decade. And people are, are hurting financially due to that. So I think we need to limit it. Uh, I would not be for an expansion of it. When it comes to the rural hospitals, we've seen this happening for over a decade now. Uh, I believe the state of Tennessee is up to 20 plus rural hospitals closing across it, which makes us one of the top two or three in the nation. And that is not good. What we need to do is come up with an adequate solution to provide care to these patients in the rural settings, whether that's a clinic or whether it is a full blown hospital and then track that and see that the, the solutions from that care are being adequate as well. You know, you want, you want to provide care, but we want to make sure that it's good quality care as well. So my goal would be to get up there and come up with a task force who can bring all the parties involved to the table and let's sit down and find a solution to our rural settings because it not only hurts the rural people, it also hurts their emergency services because they're having to drive farther and farther to get to an emergency care situation where they can get a room. And we don't need that because we know that uh, emergency services, they, they work hard enough as it is with uh, very little gratitude on the back end. Thank you. All right, uh, the next topic. Um, while Governor Bill Lee's school voucher program died this year, it's likely to come back in the next legislative session. Do you support school vouchers and why or why not? I will start with you, Greg. Well, Chris, the question that begs to be answered is why are we talking about school vouchers in the first place? Obviously, somebody thinks there's a failure somewhere and it's usually the parents. So I'm not too naive to know that there's probably inner city schools in, in Tennessee that are suffering and those parents want some uh, options to their children to get education, but they can't afford that. And I understand that. Um, there's also private schools. The other issue is what they're teaching the children. Parents are not always in agreement with what that is. So you have to look at what it brings when the voucher bill came up. And let's talk about homeschooling. So for example, if the way it stands is they would like to give money to parents for in part of the bill for parents to go to the school. We have school choice, by the way, you can go to whatever school you want, but that's not about that part of it. It's about getting some money to go to a different school, either private or homeschool. So if you're homeschooling your child, for example, if at the way it stands, if you take government money, i.e. again, government getting in the, in the, in the backyard of the parents for homeschooling, then now it falls under government rule because you took that money and that was part of the deal. So really, you're not getting another school and a different choice once you switch over to homeschooling that was that had a voucher. Now you have to fall under that government rule. There is, there was some bills. I believe there was something attached to it that was limiting testing for existing from our existing schools, limiting testing, more resources, more time for teachers, that would help. But I don't know why we can't just get some standalone bills. But I understand why these parents want options for what's being taught in their school. If the school boards can't get the right things these parents want for their children to be taught, then the state has to step in and make those rules for that to happen. Because if the people on the school board can't do it, there's going to have to be help if that's what our children need to be taught, Thank according you. to the parents. Thank you. Um, all right, Ms. Stephan, um, on the school voucher program, do you support school vouchers and why or why not? You know, Chris, for me at this point, uh, I don't believe it's a matter of for or against. I think we need to do some more research. As the bill passed this year through the legislature, it continued to change through the House and the Senate um, and ultimately died. I don't think the research has gone far enough. There are too many unanswered questions. For example, public schools are required to hold a seat for any student. 
So what happens when a student is kicked out of the private school? Where does that $7,000 go? And how does the public school now accommodate that student? What I would like to see is a bipartisan study committee created to dig deeper to answer the question so that there's no harm to any group at all. I've had kids attend private school and public school. Competition is always good, and I do believe in the freedom of educational choice. Thank you. Mr. Smith, on school vouchers? On school vouchers, I am for school choice. I think the parent has every right to dictate what happens with their child's education, whether that be a public school, a private school, charter school, or homeschooling. What I think happened this year is there were several groups who felt that they weren't heard. I actually had a two-hour conversation yesterday with a young lady who homeschools her children. I personally have never homeschooled. I have five kids and they've all gone to public school. But I listened to her side of the story and what happened is there were strings attached to this. If a homeschool, they were trying to basically force the homeschoolers to take the money if they won the lottery system, I guess is what you would call it. But that would require strings attached and testing purposes for data collection. If a homeschool parent right now is not getting paid to take their kid and, and teach them at home, why would we try to implement government oversight on that? That is the parent's prerogative if they want to teach their child in their home setting and at their pace and at their level. I don't, I don't think that this was thought, thought through completely. I think it has a chance and I think it's going to take bringing all parties to the table and sitting down and having a very in-depth discussion on what each party needs, whether it's public schools, private schools, charter schools, or homeschooling. And we, we need to make sure that all those parties are involved and their voices are heard on it. But I do believe that the money should go with the child if they want to, and it should be an opt-in situation. But we also have to make sure that we maintain our public schools because we do know that the vast majority of our school, our children go to the public schools and we cannot have a failing public school system. Uh, it would end up just like the last topic and we don't need public schools closing kind of like rural hospitals did. Mr. Mayberry, do you support school vouchers? And why right now? I absolutely, I absolutely support school choice. Let me be clear. I support public, private, parochial, micro schools, charter schools, and homeschooling as all viable forms of education. And I support the statewide call for school choice. I not only support the legislation, I have been the most outspoken elected official in Montgomery County on this topic for school choice. I even published an op-ed right here on Clarksville Now. This is not just my view, though. The Beacon Institute published that 67% of Tennesseans want school choice right now. 67% is the amount of people that drink coffee daily. That's right. The amount of people that drink coffee every day is the amount of people that want school choice here in Tennessee. Amongst Republicans, it's 85% of people, 85% uh, of Republicans that want school choice. We literally wrote it in the Republican national platform that we're a party of school choice. I believe in the parents' right to choose what's best for their children's education using their tax dollars. I'm the only elected official in Montgomery County who has also voted for school choice. We need to fund people, not specific systems. With the expertise I have in education serving right here and the school board, I will be a leading voice in the state legislature to achieve school, for, school choice for Montgomery County, for Tennessee, and when elected as your Republican nominee here in District 68, we'll get it done. Um, so, Carol Duffin, I'm closing comments. Okay. Thank you, Chris, and thank you to Clarksville Now, and thank you to um, my fellow candidates um, for you know being here for this forum. I'm not a career politician. However, there is no one that will fight harder than me for the people of District 68 and Clarksville. As the only woman candidate in this seat, I personally understand many of the issues surrounding our female constituents. Think about this for one moment. There are 99 members of the Tennessee House. Of those 99, only 12 are women. We need more of a balance at the Capitol, some fresh eyes to bring different perspectives on today's issues. I also want the people of the community to know that I will always remember I'm a public servant, elected by the people and for the people. As I stated earlier, 
I know the legislative process and how to work to get things accomplished. I will fight every day to improve our roads and our traffic and to ensure there's a plan in place with TDOT and that plan is followed through. As a military wife and military mother, I will continue to fight for our military community. I will fight for parental rights, property rights, ensuring we protect our children in school and the community while protecting our Second Amendment. I will also continue to work with our local leaders in the county and the city to bring high paying jobs with great benefits so we can continue to prosper and grow our vibrant community. I ask that you vote for me, Carol Duffin. Please visit my website at carolforclarksville.com. Thank you. All right, and Joe Smith, closing comments. I want to thank you for letting us come here today and voice our uh, platforms. And I'd like to ask each and every one of you for your vote and your support. As a local Clarksville native, Marine Corps veteran, firefighter from uh, 2008 to 2000 or 2020, uh, I've lived in this town. I've grown in this town. I've raised my family in this town. I plan to stay here and retire in this town. So my, my ability to get up there and come up with outside of the box solutions and work well with other, other people on committee levels will give us a chance to get the adequate funding we need for Montgomery County and to limit government overreach on any of the hot topics. When, when I get up there, I plan to just get to work right of way. Anybody who knows me knows that I'm, I'm a hard worker. I'm used to 12, 16 hour days and that's what I do. So there will be nobody else who will work as hard as I do. For more information, you can go to joeformoco.com and follow us on Facebook. Thank you. All right. Aaron Mayberry, closing comments. Hey, thank you, Chris and Clarksville Now for providing this opportunity. We've all shared with you our different vantage points on how we see some state legislation going on in the next year. You can trust that I will always walk in the highest integrity, and I have my life and track record shows I always have. I will fight for conservative values in every decision that I make. I'm not your typical politician. In fact, I don't believe I'm one at all. I'm a pastor. I'm an elect, a conservative uh, school board member. I am a businessman. I am also a, a father and a husband of 18 years. For nearly 20 years, I have worked to help people in their best and worst moments. I've developed leaders and I've brought people together and I can do it in the state house. Now standing at the threshold of representing District 68 in the state legislature, I'm more convinced than ever that our community deserves unwavering leadership and dedication. I believe I'd be a great state representative representing you, making you proud, and I will be the conservative voice for a new generation of Republicans here in District 68. I ask you for your vote in the upcoming state primary. Go to votemayberry.com for more information about the campaign, to request a sign, or to even sign up to volunteer. I'd love to have you go there. I genuinely hope to see you on the campaign trail. Thank you, and God bless. All right. Any closing comments, Greg Goldman? Again, thanks to... Uh all my opponents here and Chris and the staff behind the camera for doing a good job over there. Um, recently, the Senate passed a resolution in Tennessee asking for a Article 5 convention for term limits at the U.S. level. That's admirable. That's good. We all want term limits. But I didn't see a companion bill in the state or the Senate in Tennessee, so they left that out. So I guess term limits are good at the national level, but not our level. I'm not a career politician. That's not, I'm just looking to get a different direction in Clarksville and get some help. Why would a 66 year old man like me want to run for a job like this? I've got a full-time job. I fly a helicopter for a living. I'm in training with the sheriff's reserves deputies all week this week, just came from there today doesn't pay a dime. I've been doing it 11 years. I've lived in Clarksville for 37 years. I've seen where Clarksville's been, where it is now, where it wants to go. I think about the mom in her SUV caravan going to the school with her baby in there, and toddler, or maybe an elementary school child, and she's sitting in traffic, and she's going, what is taking so long? And every time somebody asks the question, on the infrastructure, they go, well, Mr. Gilman, you just don't understand. It's, it's more complicated than that. Well, she doesn't care about that. 
most of the citizens in Clarksville, they don't care what the process is. They want to see something done. They want to have results. And if you want to have results, you're going to have to elect somebody that doesn't have any outside interest in being a legislator other than getting something done. And that's me. I appreciate your vote. You can check greggilman.com. God bless, and please stay healthy. Thank you all so much, um, and thank you especially for running for office. Um, running in itself is an excellent exercise in leadership, and we really appreciate, as a community, you stepping forward to do that. Please be sure to vote in the August 1 election. Thank you.